right. Okay. Hello, welcome to Kernels. My name is Samantha Bowers. I'm the consultant for continuing education at the State Library of Iowa. And my guest today on Kernels is Andrew Hopman, and he is the director at the Lead Public Library in Clarinda, uh, which is in Southwest Iowa. And if you don't know about Kernels, Kernels is an ongoing series of short videos from the State Library of Iowa. Each installment is just a small pop of professional development that, get, that gets right to the core of a library program or service or methodology and all in public libraries. And mostly exclusively, we have in-practice librarians talking about what they're up to so that other in-practice librarians like you can learn from what they're doing. We've got these all on our CE YouTube channel and we've made a whole playlist of them. So I hope you can check them all out. Um, we also have them in Iowa Learns, our learning management system. Uh, so you can watch them there for credit. Uh, watch the video, complete the evaluation and that credit goes on your transcript. Um, Andrew is here today to talk about, um, I believe we have this uh, conversation titled Rogue Marketing. Is that right, Andrew? That sounds about right. Rogue marketing. So what we're talking about today is marketing your library kind of beyond some of the, the usual suspects, although we will talk about some of those as well. So Andrew, I think you have some slides to share with us or however you want to get us started. Thanks for being sure. here today. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Samantha. So I was kind of uh, excited to be able to talk about marketing at the library uh, because I think probably like most of our librarians in the state of Iowa, where we do it out of a labor of love and we really want people to, to utilize our services. We, we love what we do and we want more and more people to use them and make people aware of them. And you probably just get as frustrated as I do when they say, oh, I would have done that or I didn't know the library offered DVDs. We have for 10 years, DVDs are going by the wayside. We have downloadables now. Um, but how can we better make sure that everyone's aware of what we have and what's going on? Um, and I know even after even getting ready for this presentation, sometimes it feels like marketing is just throwing that pot of spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, and sometimes it's not always the same thing, but at least it's a matter of, you know, doing our best to make sure we can market our services and, and make sure we are getting people uh, to our events, to our programs and utilizing our services. Because that's what, again, we're here. No one's using us. Why am I here? Um, I want to talk a little bit, though, about uh, Clorinda and the Lead Public Library. Like Samantha said, we're located in Page County, which is southwest Iowa. Uh, we have a relatively new library that was built in 2004, uh, and our 2020 population is just above the 5,000 mark, so we're just an E-sized library, but we're right on the edge. Um, and staffing here at the library, we have two full-time and eight part-time staff. Um, of which kind of I handle the, a lot of the marketing and coordinating, but I do have some part-time staff then that kind of will have little tasks that they're doing here and there. And we even utilize volunteers to help with our marketing too. Uh, our budget uh, for fiscal year 2022 was about $410,000. There's a caveat. We got new carpet this year. So uh, about $50,000 of that is kind of a one-time expenditure that I don't think I'll get next year for uh, marketing or anything like that. Um, and then of course, our visits and circulation um, are probably about cut in half or so, and that's really due to COVID. Um, but that makes it even more important that as we um, start to open back up or start to offer programming or services that we not only market to people who maybe don't use the library, but we market to people who have stopped using the library because of COVID. Um, mm. So to me, it's really important that we reach back out to, to both traditional and non-traditional library users through whatever means and whatever tools we have. Mm -hmm. Was Clarinda part of the majority of Iowa towns that lost population in 2020, or are you guys seeing some growth? We are not seeing any growth. So we lost some population. I think we lost about three or 400 people since the last census. Mm -hmm. um, and we're fortunate or unfortunate. Um, we have a medium-sized prison in our community and that population has stayed relatively steady. Um, but that also then changes, you know, our, our numbers in terms of total households and things like that. Oh yeah. Yep. 
So I kind of wanted to start out, uh, actually, maybe not with Facebook, but with saying that we do do traditional marketing. We have a printed calendar that we have on the counter. We, of course, send things to the newspapers and to our local radio station. Um, we don't have a television station, but I will say um, our newspaper is very good about putting whatever we want in the paper or coming and doing an interview, uh, as well as the radio stations in our area. So those we still utilize. They're on our press release list that they get it too. But we realize not everyone is taking the local paper anymore, and not everyone is listening to the local radio stations. And um, we probably don't get enough airplay that we just are played at eight in the morning that one day and that radio segment might not get replayed again. Um, so some of the other marketing tools that we use are like Facebook. And I probably won't spend a whole lot of time on Facebook because I think it's more of the, probably one of the most common ones or most popular ones right now. But we do kind of make sure we always have an event post and, and things like that. Um, I wanted to make sure that, you know, if you have a Facebook page for your library, make sure it's a business account. To me, that's really important because it really allows you to see a lot more insights into your post, not just how many people liked it or shared it, but you can actually look at some of the data of what types of people liked it and shared it. How does that post compare to post at different times of day? So you can kind of see on the right hand of the screen, you can see um, paid reach, total Facebook page reach, and then even the content and how it compares to some different posts in the past. So I use this information when we're looking at, well, let's market this thing, be it an event or a program, you know, what's worked well in the past? What hasn't? Is it the time of day? Is it how, is it a photo? Is it a text? Is it a video? Um, I mean, the old adage is true that, you know, um, a picture tells a thousand words. So rarely do we have too many posts that are just text only. There's going to be some type of graphic with it. Um, and videos are generally better, but they can't be too long because people won't watch the whole thing. Um, and those are kind of some of the things we've, we've kind of experienced with as we look at who's using our Facebook. Or um, you'll notice on this page, it also ties into Instagram since Facebook owns Instagram. We do have an Instagram page, so it actually helps us to kind of look at that data together as well as if you have a business page, you can make one post that shows up on Facebook and Instagram at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, we do utilize paid ads periodically um, with our Facebook page. It's kind of hard. We really look at what the program is. So if it is kind of a traditional run of the mill program, so to speak, maybe our story hour or our monthly tech help, and those are coming along pretty fine with attendance and stuff, we probably won't pay to boost that event. But if we notice we've just started story hour back up, people may not be aware of it. We may then pay to boost that just one time to get it out there to build that habit of people coming every month or every week or whatever it is to that program. Uh, ultimately, we generally always boost any program that we're spending money on. Um, so if we're paying $500 to have a speaker come, I want to make sure maybe we spend $25 to reach 2,000 people um, on Facebook that this event is happening because, you know, gauging success of a program, um, you know, is what people get out of the program, but also how many people attend the program. Um, and, you know, one of the things, a, a quick and easy number that I run in my head sometimes is we paid $500. We only had five people come, you know, that's $100 per person. What did they get out of the program? And then look at, is that worth it? What did we do wrong? What could we do better? Um, and go from there. Uh, one of the things that has helped with that is I used to be very bad about doing program feedback and surveys. Um, but no, we have it, a, a generic website that's set up and we have printed forms that we can use. And we pretty much have a pen and a paper at every seat when people come to programs and we have them fill that out. Um, and one of the questions we ask is, how did they hear about the program? Um, and it's surprising the um, library staff is still pretty high. So, you know, I, I sometimes forget to remind people, but that's generally highly marked as well as flyers at the library. Um, but one of the tools, though, then that paid marketing, like through Facebook, allows you to get is um, 
If you like the library page on Facebook, you most likely have already had some type of connection and been to the library before. To me, one of the hardest parts and most difficult parts of marketing are to those people who, who haven't been to the library for a number of years or may have never stepped foot in the library. So we may not have, they may not have liked our Facebook page um, or they may not have a Facebook page. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you raise an excellent point there to say this is this is one tool of so many, and I like your points kind of about cross promotion as well. So you're not just thinking about it in terms of well, and I, I get a little bit tired of this example, but you know, young people don't get the newspaper, and old people don't get Facebook, and like you know, I think we're seeing some shifts some shifts there for sure. Um, but to say, well, then we don't have to have an either or like we're going to put it both places and we're going to do some of the other things that you're, you're about to tell us about as well. Yep. And tools to kind of help us keep track of everywhere that we're doing it because if we're marketing it in eight spots, we need to make sure that we're, we've got all of our ducks in a row. Correct. And, and that's kind of that. Yeah. Throw the whole pot of spaghetti at the wall. Hopefully it sticks because, you know, I want people to utilize our programs and services because uh, the more people that know about it, it's worth my time to spend on it because if no one's utilizing those services, why am I here and am I meeting the needs of the community? Um, mm -hmm. You know, so it's kind of, I wanna make sure people utilize us too. Um, I'm, I'm vested in the game as well. So uh, again, we're still kind of talking maybe more traditional stuff. I wanted to talk a little bit about our monthly email newsletter that we do. Um, we used to do a print email newsletter uh, and we didn't do an email newsletter when I first got here. Uh, I've been here since 2008. And one of the things that kind of always bothered me was the print newsletter was we picked it up here at the library. So guess what? The people that are already using the library come in every week or every month, they're getting that information. They know what's going on. They're seeing the flyers. So what about the people that haven't been here for a couple months um, or a couple years? Um, of course, with email marketing, you still have to have their email uh, to send them something, but this is a way that we can then um, send out a broad email of what's going on this month, and we put a printable monthly calendar. We still make that in Publisher, um, and that's the one thing we still print here at the library, so they can pick up the calendar and stick it on their refrigerator to know what's going on this month, um, but they can also print it off from the newsletter or just view it on the newsletter if they wanted to. Um, we use MailChimp. Uh, we use the free version. Um, it can have you, I think, up to 2,000 or 2,500 emails. Um, you can see we have 1,600 contacts in our list right now. Um, you know, uh, one thing I like about MailChimp is it's very easy to use, and it actually integrates with Canva, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So if you make a graphic in Canva, you can just hit a button and it sends it over to MailChimp for you to insert into your newsletter. Um, without having to download and upload and all that stuff. So, I mean, it makes it pretty slick um, that they work together. But just like the Facebook, MailChimp also lets you look at uh, information. So how many people opened up the newsletter? Who opened it? When did they open it? What did they click on when they opened the newsletter? And guess what? We've changed our newsletters over time when we see, okay, people really just like these things in the newsletter. Um, or they only engage with the things that are on the top four half, you know, the top half of the newsletter is what gets clicked on and then they get too busy and get distracted. So if I have something I really want to promote, guess what? It's going to be right there at the top, whereas maybe it's not till the end of the month, but if I want people to see it, it's going to be there on top. But another thing we started utilizing MailChimp for is um, segmented list. And uh, what that is, is that allows us to, we have kind of our library email list, which is all 1600 people. But then we've started just recently creating segmented lists. And we have two right now, and one of them is like cooking, and the other one is crafting. So if you have attended a crafting program at all in the library, uh, and you've either filled out a feedback form with your survey, or you've signed up, um, or you've registered if we needed registrations, we got your email, you were added to that segmented list. Um, or if you've done a cooking or a spice club or the steak tasting program we've done here at the library, um, we've added you to that one. And what we do with the segmented list is, of course, they're getting the email for each month. But then if we have um, a special crafting program, we have a button making program coming up. Um, of course, that was in the monthly email newsletter, but we'll send out one just a few days prior to our crafters 
to say, hey, don't forget, this program is in two days here at the library. Um, again, because we get, you hear that, oh, I wish I would have attended, but I forgot. Maybe they're just being nice because they don't want to say, oh, I wasn't interested. But still, we know we're doing everything we can to remind people that this event is going on. Um, and we'll probably have more lists as time goes on. I can see us doing a, um, like a children's programming one uh, or a teen programming one. Uh, we're just kind of starting out getting our feet wet with that, with how often can we do that and, and, and what do we want to send out. Um, another thing that kind we of, I don't know, you know if it would necessarily work, but my wheels are spinning here to even say like, could you, it would have to maybe involve an opt-in as well, but at any given point, run a search in the catalog to see who has things checked out in different Dewey decimal numbers and say, all right, these are the craft related Dewey numbers. Here you go. You might be interested in this, in this curtain making class. And certainly children's would be another example of that folks who have checked out children's materials, but then just to let them opt in to say, yeah, I am interested in this kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. You could send them a, send them one email saying, Hey, we've noticed uh, kind of do the based on your browsing history, you would really like these types of programs and events. And that's mm -hmm. actually a, a, a really good idea um, and something we've looked at when people are trying to, you know, what's your next skill at the library? Well, yeah. if we see they're, they're checking out a lot of these things, well, you know, like any good librarian, if you check out lots of books on building dollhouses, I'm probably going to ask you, Samantha, do you build dollhouses and do you want to do a program at the library for us? You yeah. know, connect with other people then that, that might do that. Um, but no, that's an excellent way to kind of maybe tailor some of those um, uh, uh, segments, and that might be more applicable for something like Wildberry too, when we get to that a little later on in my presentation. Another thing that we utilize um, MailChimp for is we've set up a couple automation or welcome emails. So when people um, get put into the system or they sign up, um, it automatically dings them an email saying, oh, hey, you know, normally when you sign up, you just join the newsletter and then you wait till the monthly newsletter comes. Well, we've made an automation. So when a new email gets entered, uh, the MailChimp will send them an email. Welcome to the library. We're so happy you're here. We have all these great services. Here's a link to our databases. Use your library card number. Here's a link to uh, help videos on how to use those databases. We also have a library of things. So click here to see all the neat stuff we offer. Uh, and it's just kind of a way to, you know, welcome them and, and maybe expose them to some other stuff. Of course, it links to our Facebook page. Make sure you like and follow us on there um, and make sure you sign up for our library, which again, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I wanted to mention a little bit about opt-in and opt-out. Um, you know, there's a, a good debate of, do you opt people in or do you opt people out? You know, that's something, you know, you have to look at as a library and a local level, how do you want to do that? You know, there's pros and cons to both. If you do um, an opt out, you may get more bounces and more reports of spam. Um, if you do an opt in, you know, your audience is most likely going to be a little bit smaller. So uh, we kind of did an opt out with like an opt in. So we sent one like, hey, please sign up everyone in our ILS. Here's our newsletter. Here's how you sign out of the email and opt out of it and send them a very clear email that this is what they could do to, to not use that. Mm -hmm. um, another thing we use the segmented list for is reminders about events. So uh, if you are in that cooking email list, we will send you a letter a few days before the program just to remind you, hey, you've registered, here we go. And that's how, when we take the registrations, we know to, again, add them to that segmented list of cooking or crafting there. <laughs> so here's the wild berry that I was going to talk about that I've kind of mentioned a few times before. Um, now, wild berry is a paid service. Um, it's, oh, maybe about $500 a month or so for, for our library. 500 um, a month or 500 a oh, year? Oh, sorry, 500 a year. Yeah, okay. $500 a year for, for our library. And like I said, we're that e-size library. And it might be that same price for larger libraries or not. Um, what I really like about Library is um, what it does is it sends out every week uh, an email with all the new stuff that you've added to your ILS or, or catalog and you don't have to do anything. So when, oh, cool. 
when you sign up, you tell them we use this ILS, we use um, uh, Book Systems Atrium here. They set it up. So every time I add a new book, it's going to show up or a movie or whatever, it shows up in the list here. And then that gets sent out weekly to our patrons. And what the patrons can do then is when they get that, if they click on it, it will take them to the card catalog record and they can reserve it or read more of the description or see if it's checked out. Um, and then they can also customize the newsletter. So most users probably just get everything. They get the kids, they get the nonfiction, the fiction. But I've had a few patrons who say, oh, I, I like getting that email, but I don't care much about the kids stuff. I don't have kids. Um, well, you can customize that newsletter as a user saying, I only want the nonfiction books or I only want um, cooking books. So then it's just gonna show you those um, each week. It doesn't mean we always add stuff, um, but what, we, what it does do is it also connects to uh, Bridges. So even if there's a week where we don't add anything, Bridges is generally adding content all the time. Um, mm -hmm. It's gonna show new eBooks and stuff like that. Again, they could customize their newsletter to not show the eBooks, so then they may not have much being displayed in their newsletter that week but it's all automatic. All I have to do is catalog my stuff each week, which I'm doing anyways. Yeah. Um, do you know if the user or um, like if there's nothing added, is it just a skip for that week or do they get something just with general about the library info? What, what comes through that week if nothing is new? Well, there's always been stuff added to Bridges. So it's always sent okay. out an email. Um, so I've never had it not send one out. Well, that's the Bridges connection is huge. That's really nice because it kind of also takes the pressure off you to feel like I've got these kids books sitting on my desk, but I don't have time to catalog them right now. But if I don't, there's not going to be anything in WoW. Yep. You know, there's I, always going to be stuff coming. I, I still stress out a little bit. Um, for us, our newsletter goes out Wednesdays. So Tuesday is kind of set aside as my catalog day um, that I always try to get things done. So I know they're in the WoW library. Um, but that also helps with our workflow here because we have staff and volunteers that help process our materials so they, they know on Thursdays that they're going to be processing the materials. Um, a little neat tidbit is kind of every Wednesday morning when we come into work, um, our ILS notifies us when people reserve from the OPAC because we have to pull the books for them. Well, you can always tell when people, oh, the library went out because there's always more reserves um, that are queued up because they got notified of that. That's awesome. To, I mean, I, I think it's kind of like instant gratification as a marketer, right? To say like, oh, that new, we're picking on our, our cooks and bakers today, but that new cookbook is getting a bunch of hits. <laughs> it must have been at the top of the Wildberry list or whatever. Yep. yep. And, and a few other neat features with Wildberry is it's kind of hard to see, but at the bottom, you can see where we mentioned Labor Day that we're going to be closed. Um, it took us probably two years before we actually started doing more with Wildberry and we just set it and forget it. So it just did the new stuff we added every week. We didn't do anything. Um, but now uh, one of my part-time staff, one of, one of the jobs they do Monday nights is they, they add little alerts or messages or news to the Wildberry newsletter. So you can um, say that we're going to be closed for Labor Day this week or well for next week. And that's coming out every week. So again, throwing that pot of spaghetti at the wall, we're going to put that on Facebook and the flyers and in the newspaper, but we're also going to send it out in the monthly email. But guess what? You got that on the 1st of September. By the time it's the 15th of September and that event on button making is coming around, you're not gonna see that email in your inbox anymore. But guess what? When the library pops up and you see some neat books and you scroll down, you'll see the reminder of what's going on that week at the library. Um, and it's all contained within the library. So it's really mm -hmm. a neat way that we can kind of what's going on this week to remind people that there's things going on. Uh, and you can have links so you can click on it and it will take you to the event in Facebook or your website. You can also set up uh, schedules so you can say, I want this event or ad to run for two newsletters mm -hmm. and then it will stop automatically so you don't have to go back you could schedule everything on the first of the month for the whole month if you really wanted to and it could be different each week there's a lot of tools that you can use and and for for what it cost us and what our patrons get out of it i mean it, it does wonders it also will um when it sends out that email on wednesdays of the new items 
we have it set up to post to um, Facebook and Instagram automatically that says the library's at it, five new bestsellers, and then they can kind of follow the links to get to the library and then get to our card catalog that way. It's mm -hmm. been pretty nice because it can be pretty hands-off. Well, yeah, and the, the, the cross promotion, I think, is big when you're talking about marketing strategy. And the other thing I kind of like about this one is that it really is a way to stay with maybe some of your more engaged users, too, because they've already opted into this. You, you kind of know what they're interested in. And so you can really target them with these specialized reminders and, and um, opportunities. So I think I think this is this is cool. This was a new one to me. Yep, and, and that brings up a good reminder of probably one thing we don't do enough is, you know, with a lot of things, it's kind of set it and forget it. So we promote it Wildberry pretty hard when we first got it. Um, but now an idea is, well, we probably need to do a Facebook post about, hey, go here and sign up for those that haven't signed up yet um, on Wildberry. But you need that's to where promote the Facebook your helps. promotion tool. Yep. Market yep. your marketing. <laughs> Market your marketing, yep. Um, the other thing I was going to say, too, on that front um, for folks is I think the example of we just did this one little thing with it for two years and we knew we weren't doing everything we could. And now we're slowly starting to do more. And I think for for small libraries, you know, that's definitely something to keep in mind. You don't have to make a Facebook post every day. You don't have to use every feature of this thing. Um, but if you've got a time to do a little bit, you know, every little bit helps. Um, and then slowly add more stuff in, so. And I know there are some other tools that kind of are similar to Wildberry. I think Novelist might have one. Uh, and then there's maybe like Library Adware. There's a few others out there. Um, you know, they all do the same thing. They're all awesome. I mean, as long as it works and it's not super labor intensive for, for me and my staff, um, but we've seen um, pretty good engagement with Wildberry. Um, but anytime you can kind of, show people what the new books at the, are at the library because most libraries are probably like ours. You know, a majority of your circulation comes from that new section. Mm -hmm. um, and this is just getting more people excited about what's there and maybe exposing them to something that's new. And then if we can throw in an event or a program or a service in that news uh, items, maybe connect with them that way as well. Absolutely. So another one I wanted to talk a little bit about is um, Google My Business. And um, the Google My Business is a way that you can claim your Google listing um, through Google. So if you haven't done that, it's pretty easy, but you kind of have to go through a couple hoops and they have to call you and mail you things to make sure that you're at your address. Um, we did it a couple years ago. And it was actually because of some of the marketing programming that I had attended at our local chamber office. So I said, well, how can we get the library in the front of more people's faces? And, and this is actually a free way to do it. Um, so once we were able to kind of claim our listing, you get a lot of features then that you can do within Google. Um, if you've ever Googled something, you've probably seen, you know, some listings that when it's not just Google listed and the website, it's got all these other features and, and things that you can do to engage with the page before you even get to the page. And often that's done through um, a really neat Google My Business listing. So what, what we've done is we've just recently, we've claimed it for a while, and really we claimed it just because I wanted our search ranking to be really high. And another thing that we learned from that is make sure you have lots of good photos and then uh, supposedly, if you have panoramic photos, and we have a 360 camera, so we have a lot of, you can do a 3D walkthrough through the, of our library through the Google Photos, um, and those get like 2,000 views every month. I don't know who's viewing them, but it's just crazy. But that helps bump up our search listings, because through Google Our Business, we list copy, faxing, Wi-Fi. So whenever someone's in our area and they type in any of those key search terms that we've added for services, that our library provides, guess what? Our ranking, our search is going to be up there pretty high um, when people are, are trying to find us. Mm -hmm. But one thing in terms of like event promoting that we started to do, and we really started it with COVID-19, is they allowed you to do, you can see here a COVID-19 update. So that meant when people would Google to see if you're open, it would say, well, these are the current COVID practices. Oh, um, so you could remind people masks are required or not, or um, whatever other questions yeah, might have social come up. Social distancing, whatever might be the policies that are going on at the time, or if you're closed, 
Um, you could do that with a COVID-19 update and it was up there right at top and it's what other businesses were doing. So they were very familiar from more commercial businesses, how they were interacting and marketing to them that we could do some of the same. Mm -hmm. But you can see up there at the top, you can also add an offer. I think we, we tried that once where if they clicked on that and they printed something, they could come in and get like a pen or something from us. It didn't work as well as I would have liked, but we just wanted to try it. I always um, do that with, you know, print this off, come get your library card and then start checking out as many books as you want. But like, that's what you do anyway. Yep, exactly. So <laughs> Free library it. books for whoever brings this in. Yep, yep. Um, so we haven't had a ton of success with that, but I know some businesses have. Um, we use it ultimately for kind of um, doing events. So you can see here, we post it um, an event on our tiny tot time. And again, this just shows up when you get to the basic Google page about what's going on at the library without even clicking to our page. So it's just another way to market it and catch their eye even faster. Um, and also if you put a description, if someone's searching for you know children's activities near me and they got their GPS on in Clorinda, it should flag this event then that it may not if it was just text typed on our website. Um, so it's just a way to, again, try to catch everyone on different ways. Um, and the same graphic that we use for Tiny Tot Time, we've also used in our email newsletter. So we're just copy and pasting it in here that it's going on. Yeah, not only is it like lazy, <laughs> good marketing, it's also like kind of name recognition too. If someone saw that on a promoted Facebook and then they see it here and then maybe there's something going on with this whole library thing and maybe you should go check it out they seem kind of organized yeah hopefully we can get it in their face a couple of times that they finally stop and really read the description or figure out what's going on yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so I really recommend if people haven't um claim the listing to claim it and then actively you know make sure it's filled out list what services you offer list your hours so then add those photos of the library even if they're not 360 the more photos you have um, your search results will be a little higher. You'll be able to maybe do some events that then would engage more people. Um, yeah, I love the idea of adding photos too. I know as an end user, um, as you know, we're pretty new in, in Des Moines, the city where we live now. And like being able to pull up a photo and say like, oh, that is not going to be a good place to take my toddler. Um, or that's going to be a great place to take my toddler. Or I don't want to go there because I don't have my toddler and it looks like too many other people's toddlers are there. For example, just, you know, to say, um, kind of give people an idea of what to expect once they get there. Yep. Yep. Inside, outside. I'm just thinking, you know, you know your meeting rooms, all that stuff is going to be great ways to just tell people what's going on. And one of the things that I've investigated, uh, and I would welcome any feedback from other libraries or librarians who are watching this is there is some tools that, um, Google will give libraries, I think, $10,000 in ad, Google ad credit every year, I think. Um, and what that is, is if you Google something and you get the sponsored listings at the top because you typed in ladders um, and Home Depot shows up, well, you could set up, um, there's companies that you can pay to do this for libraries, and I've talked to them and they're very expensive, but um, you can use some free Google credit, but I think you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get that that if you typed in home repair, Clorinda, we could have our home repair books as sponsored at the top of there that would direct you to our card catalog or our databases that may have home repair or automotive repair. Um, yeah. It's something that I've looked at and that libraries are doing. I'm not sure about any in Iowa, but I'd be interested to, to, to have those conversations. And that is an opportunity that, that could be investigated. Well, yeah, absolutely. That's, it all starts from having kind of an online presence that someone's not just thinking it's coming out of left field. Yep. I'll just spend a little bit of time um, talking about YoDeck. Uh, YoDeck is a commercial product, um, but you can kind of get started and use it for free. Uh, what it is, is it's digital signage. So uh, we have a TV mounted uh, here at our circulation desk, and you can see that with the inset photo there. And that is, it used to be connected to an old computer that we had that was slow um, and it would run a PowerPoint. So if we wanted to edit the PowerPoint, we'd have to turn the computer off and edit the PowerPoint and then play it again. Well, guess what? It would freeze up or turn off and not turn on and then we'd have to remember to start it and all this other stuff. So um, 
we actually went with a digital signage solution. These are the companies that Burger King or McDonald's or the movie theaters use that do their menu boards. They use a company, if not Yodec, one like this. Um, and you can have one screen for free and it doesn't cost anything if you use your own Raspberry Pi, which is what runs the software. By one screen, you mean like one, one monitor essentially with multiple pictures looping through it, or you're stuck with one picture on that? Nope, just one screen. So you can have multiple photos, multiple videos. They have little widgets. So ours also shows the local weather. It also okay. shows what events we have. So we have it tied to our library online calendar. So it shows story hours happening today. And then after story hours is this program. Um, and it actually changes color depending on what time of day it is. Okay. Um, and that's all automatic. And for one screen, it's free. It's pretty easy to use. It's kind of drag and drop um, with, you want, with what you want to edit. Uh, of course, we use Canva and we upload the photos, but you can also do videos. So we have it showing um, there's a, a bridges or not a bridges, but an overdrive Libby promotional video. So that gets looped through and shows people reading ebooks and how to download from overdrive and Libby. And that was free. So we just downloaded it from the, the overdrive website. We also have one for um, creative bug, which is another database we have. So it loops that video in addition to showing our technology help. So when we make our, our graphic in Canva, this is the same graphic that we will use in our email newsletters, our Wowbrary, our Facebook post. We're also using it in Yodec. Um, and it, once we set it up, you can actually tell things when to stop. So it won't show that slide after the event's over if you program and set it up that way that will stop showing it after the state. Um, Perfect. And it works. And we did upgrade our TV to a newer TV that uh, allows it to turn off and turn on automatically. So we don't touch it. The only thing we do is maybe once a month, we go in and we, we add more slides to it. Um, and we have a volunteer that fortunately does that for us. Um, and then it just goes there. It turns on in the morning, turns off when we close, and it just works. Um, Perfect. It's pretty pretty neat. Uh, there are other products out there that do the same thing. Um, Yodec was pretty easy, and it was free for the one screen. We've looked at buying more screens and having uh, maybe another screen in our children's library, but also having screens at other departments in the city. So um, the, the vision of that would be we could have some screens at our lead center, which is our recreational center here in Clarinda, but also City Hall. So then what that would allow us to do as a group would be, of course, we could have screens just for the library about, you know, keep the noise down, no food, um, or whatever signs we have, return your books on time. And then those are just displayed at the screens here at the library. And then our, our recreation center could have, you know, swimming practices tomorrow, or make sure you wipe down your machines after each use. But then if we're promoting something like our summer library programming, um, we might want that to be displayed on all of the screens and you can just click a button to say, yeah, show it on all of them. And if our rec center is saying, hey, we've got, you know, fall football lesson leagues going on, they can say, yeah, push that to the library too. Um, so that's something we're working on again, just trying to get that message out there in front of all the faces. With that, though, there's more screens, so there's a price involved there. So we've been kind of talking, is it worth it? Do we want to do that? Who's going to manage it? Um, right. Things like that. But that's that's something these types of tools give you. Yeah. So how do you keep it all straight? What's well, your that that's my next slide. Um, Good. Sometimes it feels a little chaotic. Um, uh -huh. Uh, what, what we do when most of our stuff is now designed and made in Canva and, okay. um, we have that kind of linked together with different accounts. A different staff member can see kind of all the stuff we're working on and edit or comment or do that. Um, and are you paying for Canva? We, uh, get the nonprofit discounted okay. access to Canva, which is great because their stock images and everything like that mm -hmm. is, is wonderful. So mm -hmm. I would, uh, if you don't get that, reach out to them. Um, you may have a friend or a foundation group that you may be able to partner with in order to get that uh, if your city or library doesn't qualify um, that way. But once we create those graphics, what's really been super important, especially having more than one person and volunteers working on it, is using a program, a project management software. We use Asana here in Clarinda 
we've been probably using it for three or four years. Um, I really like it. Um, let me share my screen and I can actually kind of show you what our Asana board looks like here. Yeah, perfect. Um, I know people are going to see this Asana board and feel really overwhelmed. <laughs> I imagine uh, there's a lot going on probably, but, you know, kind of find something that works for your team and stick with it. I imagine is going to be the end message here, but I'm excited to see how you guys are using this one. And this is free as well for you. Is that right? Yep. Um, Asana, uh, kind of just like yeah, uh, Yodek and some of the other things, you know, they have paid versions, but they also have mm -hmm. free versions. Mm -hmm. um, with Asana, we're using the free version, okay. um, which, you know, we've kind of had to alter how it works to make it work for us because I didn't want to pay for the paid version for the features that I kind of would have liked, but are they worth it? Um, again, I will say that uh, if you're really good with just remembering all the little details of every little thing you've got going on, great. If you need to do paper checklist, you know, that's how we used to do it. Um, but that was great when it was just me. But now that we have volunteers and other people doing it, it's, I don't know where that checklist is. Do they know if it's done or not? Um, a, a shared document, be it an online document um, or a project management software tool really has made it easy. Um, it is a little chaotic here, I will admit, um, but it makes sense to me. So the way we have our um, Asana set up, as you can see here, is kind of our programming calendar. Let me see if I can figure it out. So we have it broken down in kind of our different boards. So the first board is program ideas. These are things that we've either had to do that we want to do, or like our retro game night was a COVID program that got canceled that we want to bring back. We just haven't done it, but it's all set up. Um, so it's ready to get moved over to upcoming programs and then hopefully to complete it programs. And then we have reoccurring programs. And the reason we have reoccurring programs is sometimes we just copy that event and change the date and change the flyers on it. Um, and then to the far right, we have our social media calendar and that's really tied into marketing. And you can see up here, we have this master one. So this one, we just duplicate every month. Well, before the end of the month and um, update it so we can see, okay, who's gonna create the newsletter and MailChimp? We need to print our monthly calendar. Who's mm. going to update our dial a story reader? Well, those are the monthly posts because we wanna promote that because we're paying for it. I wanna make sure people are using it. Um, we try to promote a database. Um, we work on the library memes. Um, we do our library, who's gonna do that? Add it to our traditional radio KMA calendar. Um, and then we got to set this up for next month too, because I already need a reminder to set my reminders, you know? Um, Absolutely. Well, I love that having that, because if it's a slow night on the desk, someone can go in and maybe make a graphic or, um, you know, do some research on a database to promote whatever it is, but you've got that in front of everyone to say, and this is everyone's job in some ways, if you've got a minute, yep, here and, you go. And we actually utilize it a little bit differently um, with mm -hmm. Asana. You can actually assign. Uh -huh. I know there's Perfect. people who's trained on how to do um, this or that. So they're mm -hmm. going to get that assigned to them. And we're pretty flexible. At least I am with my due date. So it's just like, at least by the end of the month, oh, it may say the 15th, which I like, but you know, end of the month is really what it means. Um, mm -hmm. Just get it done. So mm -hmm. you can see here, this is for um, this month. So you can see here, um, the little icon is Andrew Hopman. So you can see I completed that task. And then the third week for our wild prairie, um, Katie here hasn't done that, but that's not till next week anyways, that she needs to get that done on Monday. And what's nice about um, Asana is it will send those people who have those tasks to do reminders, which can be frustrating because there's been times where I get my task list and there's about 12 red overdue ones because I had something come up, but guess what? I know when I get time, I'll get through them. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to share here with like one of our kind of one-off programs here, we did a, a steak tasting program, which I will tell you, if you have a, a steakhouse, um, it was a wonderful program, um, lots of great steak too. And I learned a lot and the, our patrons loved it. We had, I think about 40 people and we had to turn a number of people away because we could only accommodate that many in the space. Um, but if you scroll down here, you can see we have, of course we want we need to get it on our Google calendar um, but then we have press release, Facebook event. Is it our website crawler in library display? That's the Yodec board. Do we have it on there to promote it? 
the traditional print flyers are they like posted around town. Um, and what's nice, like I said, is we can go up here and we can um, duplicate this task if we do a, um, oh, maybe a, I'm trying to think something other than steak tasting, but maybe a pork tasting program. I don't know. Um, or maybe well, any a, big kind of adult, like any big kind of adult program would be the same. Your dollhouse building um, from earlier, right? You're not going to yep. contact the restaurant, but you're still going to post flyers and a lot of your elements are going to be the same, be it if you're promoting mm -hmm. a story hour or you're promoting a steak tasting program mm -hmm. or you're promoting uh, the friend's book sale. You know, mm -hmm. it's going to be the same things that you want to make sure. Did we do this? Did we do that? And that's where having a checklist, be it on paper or maybe something a little more techie like um, Asana is great because you could have a clipboard and have that on the, the common workspace, right? And it's just, okay, whoever's got to do it has to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I need those. Uh, harassing emails from Google Calendar or from Asana to, to keep me on task sometimes. Absolutely. So I'll jump back to my slide here. I think this is your next slide, but is this where we're headed? You've got, you've got all this going on. What's next? Or have you reached peak, peak marketing? Um, uh, can you see my screen here again? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Still coming. Here we go. So future ideas. Um, again, we're probably just going to be throwing that pot of spaghetti. So whatever we can find to put in the pot, we're going to be seeing if it works and throwing it. Mm -hmm. We've done stuff in the past that hasn't worked. We've never really took off with Twitter. Um, so we don't do Twitter anymore. Um, we've talked about looking at TikTok and maybe utilizing some of our high school um, pages and workers. Would that be something they might be interested to engage with that population? Um, but we've also looked at um, one that's really interesting to me is like a Wikipedia page. Because, you know, whenever you search for something, you know, Wikipedia kind of comes up right away. So how can the library have a Wikipedia page? And then with that Wikipedia page, um, the few libraries that I have seen that have them, they, they talk about their programs and services as a posting on Wikipedia and it directs you to then the library's website. That's marketing. You know, mm -hmm. people discover, oh, there's this thing in Clorinda, there's a library, they're doing this. Oh, you know, as long as we're driving them to our programs and services and what we offer, ultimately that's what our, the goal of the marketing is. Um, for, for most people and especially for us here in Clorinda. Um, and then just kind of, like I said, seeing what, what's around the corner. Um, you know, we generally try to stick with something for a little bit to see if it works, but you know, at some point, is it still working? Is it worth the time? If it is, try it. Um, if it isn't, maybe it's time to alter it or try something different. Um, you know, we, we try not to spend a ton of time on marketing. And that's why when we, we make that one graphic in, in Canva, we try to use it as much as we can because we are a small library. Um, and I know there's a lot of smaller libraries out there, but ultimately, you know, if it's worth taking the time to do the story hour or taking the time to devote budgetary dollars to it, it's worth it to devote the time to market it. Be it if you're just out there handing flyers out that you printed in black and white, to the local businesses, that's marketing. Keep doing that. I mean, we still do that. Uh, but also understanding that, you know, there's a lot of people that may not be using those businesses, that may not be walking through the doors of the library to see the flyer you have on your bulletin board. What else can you do to kind of grab people's attention? Because if you're like me, you know that there's services and programs that can benefit them from the library. Um, it's just making sure they're aware of it. Yeah, absolutely. Any other closing thoughts here? I'm, I'm blown away. I think you guys have done a lot on a shoestring and um, I'm excited to kind of see what's next and see how, as you have built these little components, you can keep building on them, you know, adding this feature to your Google page, adding this to your Wikipedia page, whatever it is. So I think it's cool. Yeah, no, really what I would tell a lot of people, especially if they're not Use it, utilizing too many tools is, you know, start small. So, mm -hmm. you know, pick one of these tools and, and give it a try. 
um, you know, and pick one of the free tools then, because if it doesn't work, you're not out of anything. Yep. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, how can we better engage with people? And also then reach out to, you may have volunteers. If you have a, a different organization that sends out a newsletter, um, work with them to do an e-newsletter. Can you, can you share some marketing talents and, and costs with them? Um, ultimately, you know, uh, a phrase that I use a lot when it comes to doing a program or a service or marketing, especially is, you know, um, you get out of it what you put into it. So, you know, if we really want to put a lot into this, hopefully, and we should get a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, if we don't get attendance or engagement or usage of the program, I'm going to get experience to say, okay, what I did was wrong and I can change it this way or what I did didn't work. Um, you know, that's still something we get out of it that we can use for our next event, our next marketing idea from there. Oh, absolutely. Well, thanks, Andrew, for coming today. And thanks for watching uh, folks at home. And um, if you've got, <laughs> I'm just looking at my script here, but if you've got a little more time, there's more kernels around, so you can check those out. If you're doing something at your library that's exciting you want to talk about, uh, shoot me a note and let me know that too. We want to uh, tap you for the next kernel. So thanks again to Andrew and thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.